Welcome into this Five Clubs Conversation. I'm Gary Williams. You know, this week, I'm going to talk to somebody who I've known for quite some time. As a matter of fact, we grew up in the same neck of the woods, and he was very good at what he did, and that was playing professional golf. And then life interfered, and we're going to have a talk about that and about what's next and about the path that he's on, which is one that he never thought he was going to be on five years ago. This one is one you're going to want to listen to very closely. With that, we welcome in Morgan Hoffman. How are you, my friend? Amazing. Thank you. It's good to be back. Well, it's it's great to have you here. I was saying to the staff, this is the first time we've had a guest fly in from Liberia. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Liberia to, uh, to Charlotte. It's definitely the first trip I've done in that direction. But uh, bringing up some good memories, Quail Hollow, and uh, just seeing this town blow up, it's amazing. It, it, it really is. I know you're staying downtown, uh, but you were kind enough to come in to do this. I, you know, when we launched Five Clubs last fall, you're one of the first people that I reached out to um, because you're, you're one of my favorite people, but also because of, you know, obviously the, the, the big pivot that you've had to make in your life, which, which started uh, toward the latter part of 2016, which we're going to talk about. But this is about, you know, catching up. And, and for a lot of people who, who maybe haven't seen you in a while, uh, you do look free. Uh, you, you look great, by the way. How do you feel? Yeah, I feel great. I, I feel better than ever, to be honest, because I took a good amount of time off from working out and um, really like building and trying to improve my body to be able to let it heal and take some time for rest and recuperation. And that's really hard for me. I'm an adrenaline junkie, kind of just like go all the time. And it was the hardest time that I've ever had. And so now I'm back in the gym and it's just so exhilarating and I, I just I can feel it in all my cells right now you know we're going to talk about you know your entire path because for those folks who may not know your background look I, I was invested emotionally and intellectually in you just because you know you grew up in North Jersey which which is where I grew up uh, and despite all the great golf that is up there uh, the fact is is that not many people have ever made it to the best tour in the world and you did uh being from there uh and and the fact is is that you're getting ready uh how close we're going to talk about to, to embarking back on this and and you mentioned quail hollow and and i had remembered this but my memory was jogged when i was looking at some different stuff over the weekend you almost won in this city on what is now the corn Ferry tour at longview that's right which was the chiquita classic you were in a playoff with Russell Henley and Patrick Cantlay. And uh, I'm trying to think, did Russell make a big, made like an eagle putter or something to win that golf tournament? Wow, that's uh, bringing back some good memories. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. It was my first time really in contention. I think we were all 24 under, which was pretty deep at that event. And um, no, we, I think, all tied the first playoff hole, went to the second which was the 18th hole and the pin was tucked on the right by the water. And I told my caddy, I'm like, Hey, I just want to, let's just go at the pin. And it was three off the right and the water was just right there. And I hit a great shot and it like missed the green by a foot and went in the water. So I was out. I'm not sure how Russell won after that. I kind of left Checked the premises. Out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was, was that 2011 maybe? It's a great question. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Something, well, like, yeah, something I think like right, right around there. Okay. Maybe. For, for people who have had followed your career, but, but maybe are not necessarily sure like, like what's happened, you know, look, when, when life stepped in the way uh, in 2016 and you were diagnosed with muscular dystrophy, um, you know, I, I, I can't possibly fathom news like that. But I, I want to go back even earlier because... I, I didn't have any idea about this part of, of your path was that in college, you actually noticed uh, when you were at Oklahoma State that, that your pectoral muscle 
uh, that something something was going on. Ex explain what it was that you started to notice with the body that you were very vigilant about at a young age. Yeah, I mean, Oklahoma State brought me into the world of, of working out and having our fitness trainer be the, the football trainer. We In the first couple of months that we were there, I put on 15 pounds of muscle. And then since then, that incorporating into faster swing speed, hang it further, getting more... Um, uh, perfect with iron striking and, and just like the excitement of getting better. It really was home in my life, the gym. And since I started seeing atrophy in my third year of college, it was like right from my sternum. It was just a couple inches. It was really interesting. So I thought it was like a nerve entrapment or something like that. I had no idea. I mean, I had dreams of it being like flesh eating bacteria weird like you know sure things going your your mind's head. racing exactly mind racing um and when it really hit me was when i was on a fishing trip with derek fathauer right when i turned pro in 2011 um took a picture of me holding like a huge cobia and you could see it like just the muscle was weird and since then i was like all right i gotta try to figure out what this is and um it's a long journey, five years, 2011 to 2016 of finding an answer. It was difficult. Yeah, you know, so you, when you turned professional, look, you, you, were, you were somebody who won at every level. Um, you won three times as a freshman in college at, at the, the preeminent program uh, among the great programs historically in college golf at Oklahoma State. Uh, you won the Big 12. Uh, you were a first-team All-American. You get to number one in the world amateur rankings. I mean, you, you, so you were doing all these things. And then, you know, I mentioned the, 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 the tournament at, at Longview. You get on tour, you're, you get your footing, you're making money. Um, how often were you pausing to wonder what was going on? Um, a lot. I mean, it, was, it got to a point where in between each week, of tournament play. I was going to some clinic or doctor or specialist um, in the U.S. at first, and then it started to become all over the world. Um, so yeah, I would fly to Canada, to Nepal, to the Bahamas, to um, just anywhere to find the best specialist that could possibly have an answer for this. How did you manage to compartmentalize the uncertainty of what was going on with your body uh, which clearly you were you were somewhat consumed with because you were taking all this time, but yet you managed to still perform. I mean, have you thought about that? Yeah, it was it was interesting. You know, it was kind of um, in golf growing up. You're taught to um, kind of be a robot in a sense, or at least that's the way I was taught. Um, and in some ways it was great in some ways it wasn't and for me it's like if you make a birdie you're like this if you're making an eagle you're like this and um i guess that's what kind of helped me put this to the wayside and just focus on golf and um yeah it was difficult because i knew that each year testing with track man going to tpi with titleist my swing speed kept getting lower and lower and it was just very curious um, so finally, yeah, I got the diagnosis in 2016. And when the doctor said he thought it was muscular dystrophy, I was like, oh, this guy's an idiot. You know, like there's no way I could have muscular dystrophy. How's that possible? It hasn't been in my family lineage or genetics or anything. Um, so it was a, it was a shock and definite, uh, definite time of why me, um, and just like little depression but then um, it just kind of catapulted me into this life that I'm living now. The, um, and as far as all the, you, you were not going uh, to just ordinary clinics and, and run of the mill doctors of which that, that's kind of an oxymoron, but the point is you, you went to the Cleveland Clinic, you went to Mayo, uh, you went to the, uh, I believe, uh, the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. Uh, you actually went back there um, so you're going to the very best and they're confounded. They didn't have answers for you. Mm -hmm. Did, did that start to make you wonder like, like not only obviously what is going on, 
uh, but about Western medicine, about like the best of the best that they couldn't find, they couldn't find what the answer was. Of course. I mean, yeah, that was definitely the question um, in my head and, and like, why couldn't they find answers? And, you know, Western medicine is, is amazing for so many things. Like if you break your arm or if you have trauma, if um, there's, it's, I'm so thankful for, for all the doctors in the world who spend years of their life studying this type of medicine. And, um, it's, but there's, there's more, there's more to life. There's more to the body. There's more to, um, humans, energetic beings. And it's, uh, it's incredible. And it's hard that I know now that science hasn't been able to figure out answers for a lot of things and, um, answers for a lot of people with, uh, rare diseases. And, um, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to come out publicly with this is because, you know, I felt alone. And when I came out, I didn't feel alone anymore. People Mm -hmm. wrote to me and told me their stories and it was, uh, very heartfelt. And I felt like there was a, a community out there that had and went through the same things as me. Um, and what I've learned is that, um, the body is just not segmented. You know, I don't just have atrophy in my right pectoral muscle and I I can't just treat my right pectoral muscle. You have to treat the body as a whole and not just the body. You have to treat your spiritual side, your energetic side, your, your soul, if you want to call it that. And, um, yeah, just so much research and meeting so many incredible people and indigenous and healers from all around the world. And it's, it's opened my eyes to so many things that, um, typically we here in the United States aren't, um, open to or, uh, learn about because it's, it's just not readily available or, um, taught about. So that's what is leading, uh, Chelsea and I, my wife to create this, the center of natural healing. And, um, it's, I'm just so excited about it because it's going to teach people how to take care of their whole body, um, and mind and soul. We're, we're going to talk about this center because I know that that is, uh, you know, a dream of yours and it's it's you know with the money that you've already raised through the morgan hoffman foundation if you want to learn more about it uh you just simply have to go to morganhoffman.org uh you you know it's set up you can donate money uh if you want and i've always said a lot of a little is a lot um and anything that you can give uh i know how much you uh, and the people who have committed their time and all their energy uh to to raise the money that, that you want to to be able to provide um this place for people to heal in every possible way. And I, I'm, I want to talk in depth about it because I mean, it's, it's your passion and it's great to see somebody, uh, you know, take the blow that you've taken and, and turn it into, uh, all the energy and all the passion and the commitment that you have. When you got the diagnosis, I just want to read something that, that you said that the doctor, I guess it was in Miami that the doctor who finally told you, you know, that, or, or you went to see this doctor after you got the diagnosis and, and he said something to the effect of, you know, this is what it is, uh, and come back in 10 years and we'll try to keep you mobile. And it was like, without any inflection in his voice, it was just, it was just like this antiseptic statement. And, and you said, you said, fuck this, this is not how you treat people. Yeah. Um, does that stick in your mind, the, yeah. like that conversation? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of uh, the pin in this, uh, the beginning, basically, I, I would call it. I mean, the diagnosis call from the, the doctor at HSS was a huge part of it, but then learning that I had something that other people have and going to the best specialist in the world in Miami and being treated like that, that's exactly how it happened. I remember it like it was yesterday and there was um, the doctor and I think a few of his assistants in there. And it's like they all had straight faces and no sympathy and um, no compassion. And it's just they 
they treat humans like a just another check on their daily schedule and that's what motivated me to to start all this um at the time i didn't know it though um chelsea was the one who kind of motivated motivated me and, and us to get our ducks in a row um at the time i was hurt and had no direction and and she was like hey like why don't we start something here like you have an amazing platform and i'm just so lucky that i found her mm. and she is uh been such a rock in this and and learned and studied even more than i have on on regenerative detoxication on healing on reiki on uh native american uh healing traits and journeys on on everything it's just it's so incredible uh, to have a partner that can push me like that and yeah so that's that is the moment that that really started this journey and and then um from there i started learning about herbs and plant medicine and it was just like a, a rabbit hole of going into different books and and videos and and just people that aren't mainstream and i embarked on this huge fast because i realized that um i can say so many things here and i'm just like so passionate about this it's like i don't know where to go but the the body when it it takes on a dis-ease I, I hyphenate the word dis-ease because it's just something that is being brought up in your body to tell you that hey there's something wrong address this and um, take note and maybe step back from some of the things that you're doing that can can be causing this um it's uh for me specifically uh, muscular dystrophy is a genetic mutation mm -hmm. so the gene can be turned on or it can be turned off. And so this, this muscular dystrophy gene, the DUX4 protein, which is lacking um, for my type of muscular dystrophy, FSH, um, was turned on by my environment. And uh, most people think environment is who you're with or like where you're living. And, and that definitely is the case, but also it's the environment within you and the environment that your mind is set in. So taking into those considerations, I needed to do a huge detox from, from everything in my life, from people that didn't serve me to TV shows, to television in general, to um, any type of uh, products that had preservatives or chemicals or pesticides in it from my shampoo to my toothpaste to um, my bed sheets uh, and then especially food is the biggest one so yeah I went um, on this journey of detoxification and and went down from eating meat and steak and, and bison and and sweet potatoes on the course I prided myself in that uh, going on tour and having my own food and it uh went down to just eating vegetables and raw vegetables and just fruit and then juices and then only grapes for months at a time and um at that time i was in this big uh detox and chelsea and i have have ties to nepal and she went over there to help some of the uh earthquake victims mm -hmm. and our friend sean einhouse who actually played on the team with us at oklahoma state his family started a um, a foundation there for the kids who um, needed housing because their families were back up in the mountains rebuilding their homes from the earthquake. So Chelsea went over there for a couple of weeks and and helped the kids and found this doctor through miracles uh, that specialized in muscular dystrophy and, and herbal um, practices. So. I was in the middle of like these big cleanses and in Florida and Jupiter, not being able to get off my couch. And if I got up, it would just like pass out half the time. And she's like, Hey, I think you should really consider coming over here and, and trying this out. 
And so I did, it was a 90 day treatment and um, I think it really helped. It was really difficult, uh, but that was one of the start starting factors into this, this healing journey because every day I was just studying and researching. And when I was not on the, the massage table, massage table was more like a treatment table. They were rubbing these herbs into me so hard for six hours a day for 90 days straight. Wow. Um, and it was difficult mentally, but I learned uh, a lot. And that's really where it all started to drive this vision further into making uh, a center or space that people can come. And even if they don't know what they have, we'll, we'll take you back down to the basics and, you know, take your shoes off, re reintroduce you to the earth and, and uh, nature. You mentioned uh, FAs. FSH, uh, which is the form of, of MD that you have. There's several different forms. Primarily with, with you, the, the MD that you have, it affects, uh, I believe, is it, is it shoulders, facial area, mm -hmm. and, and what else? Well, it's different for everybody. Okay. You know, um, it's fasciocapular humeral. Um, for fascial scapular area, humeral, yep. and possibly the leg sometimes. I have some atrophy in my right quad as well. But yeah, it's different for everyone. I heard, I mean, there's people who just have a little bit of atrophy and just can't play sports anymore, but they can live their daily lives or, um, yeah, gymnasts or, you know, golfers that yeah. <laughs> can uh, lose their careers over it. So. It's, it's, I mean, it is in, in a crude way, I mean, it, it, it eats mm -hmm. human muscle, mm -hmm. um, and that's what, it's, that's what it's doing. You know, when you're going through this and, and you're starting to see not only a, a, a physical, you know, to, to do what you did for 90 days in the physical part of it, what was it doing to you from, a, from a, an emotional and spiritual standpoint? Did you, did you sense a transformation that was, that was kind of running stride for stride with how you were feeling physically? It's a good question. Um, it, at the time, I didn't know what was happening. It just kind of it just kind of happened. Um, I was lonely over there. Uh, I was I had a lot of time on my hands, other than I had to wear this these herbs on me all the time and wear these linens, and it smelled terrible. And I just had to find things to do with my day. Um, so thankfully they had a library and this place I was staying was, um, very health conscious and they grew their own food and they had a, their own farm. And a lot of the books had to do with that. And there was this one book that was natural cures that they don't want you to know. And it was like a 900 page book and I just dove in and it was unbelievable. And I think the guy that wrote it, Kevin Trudeau, uh, went to jail for it and is still in jail because he was just uh, opening up natural cures of herbs and things that you can do to get rid of diabetes, Parkinson's, like all these things, AIDS that are incurable, you mm -hmm. know, in quote unquote. When was so this it was, written? It was written maybe early 2000s. Okay. So not that old. Um, so I was, I was very intrigued and then I just, started researching if these things are possible that he's saying in this book. And uh, it was just mind blowing to see, and, and mind blowing to see how hard it was to get to these websites, to see blogs that people have written or documentaries or testimonials of, of people who actually have healed. And it's, uh, that's what really started me on this, this passing journey of telling people that they, you don't need a lot. You, you, your body is self healing and, um, take a, take a little knife, for example, and, and cut yourself by accident. You don't have to do anything. The, the blood will clot itself. It will scab over and you'll have skin again. It's like very similar with the internal organs and, and muscles. I'm trying to prove that now. Yeah. So you, you were the, the idea of alternative medicine, um, that, that term, you bristle at that term, uh, because it's, you know, you, as you've said, 
you know, Western medicine has been around a couple hundred years, maybe, uh, whereas, you know, alternative medicines, medicines from, uh, you know, the, the other part of the world is has been around for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and you even said, look, if there was if there was an ointment, if there was a pill uh, that could cure me of MD, I, I wouldn't take it. I, has that been part of the journey? Like if I would imagine that at the outset, if, if that had happened, you probably would have. I mean, is, how long did it take for you to get to the point where you said, I've crossed this threshold where it's not about that. This, this journey is about something much deeper. I think it was the, that day in Miami. It was. Honestly. Okay. I was just like, yeah, this is, if, the, if there's no answers here and, and these best specialists, then I'm going to find an answer that's, that's natural. Um, because my, my life and, and my journey has just been slowly uh, evolving into that. Um, from, you know, and even in college, I think that's what might have started at the eating fried food or buffalo wild wings and still water and um, brisket and, and peach cobblers. And <laughs> man, it's just funny thinking about it. Um, but uh, yeah, wow, such a such an incredible journey. I think it's just um, it's it's another point that I'd like to touch on is that where I am now is not a place you can just step into. This has taken me years to get into. And when people ask me for advice, like, oh, I wanna do a cleanse, like, tell me about a fruit cleanse. I'm like, well, what are you eating right now? Burgers and fries and that kind of stuff. Like, if you do a cleanse right now, your body's gonna go into shock. So you have to take it step by step. And it's important. Um, it's not something that happens overnight. I mean, there are ways that I found that if you have serious illnesses, you, you can do things overnight, um, but you just have to be prepared for your body to have an interesting time and, yeah. and see some incredible things happen. You, uh, you actually told me that you ate Brussels sprouts last night, mm -hmm. and, and probably that is a pretty decadent thing for you to be eating right now. It, yeah, I think I had some truffle oil on it too. It was like my mouth is exploding. The taste <laughs> is crazy. Yeah, it was nice. The, um, you know, when you started the foundation, uh, I was lucky enough to be at the first event that you held. And I, I, I either said this to you or wrote this to you that, that you should be exceedingly proud for what you've done. I mean, I, I've seen a lot of first year events um, and they all have great intentions and they're all good. Um, but, but I, you know, where you started was wildly impressive. You know, a lot of that has to do with the, the people that support you and, and, you know, you have great friends. When you had that first event, um, you've achieved a lot in golf. Uh, you've been you've been honored and you've been a part of special teams, Palmer Cup, Walker Cup, uh, done great things. But when that particular event, which was basically like two and a half days, uh, was over and you really I hope you took some time to reflect, how did it impact you? Um, man, so many points I want to touch on there. First, the community that um, I've been lucky enough to be surrounded by. Uh, our Cola Country Club has been a home away from home from day one. My, my dad raised me there. Uh, he was a member since I was born, and I still remember pictures vividly of me running around in diapers and plastic clubs and the putting green, and um, still some of the same members there to this day. And um, have to thank them mainly for that because they were the biggest uh, contributors to it and without them I couldn't have done it and just the the support of hosting it is, is a huge task for for their staff and um, the members as well to give that up so appreciate that more than anything um, and that first year yeah Chelsea and I uh, it was just her and I and just a, a couple friends, Jim Craffy, one of the head guys yeah. at, at uh, Arcola, and then one of our friends, Mark Erlewine, who is a genius with uh, design for all the signage and, and uh, outreach. And it was a lot of work. Um, you know, I raised over a million dollars that first year, and we're just so excited that people, I tried to make it a point especially for the bigger donors like hey we're this is our vision 
And since you're giving this amount of money don donated to us, like I'd love if you have an input on where it goes. And every single one of them were like, we trust you. And we trust that you and Chelsea have uh, the vision for this. And, and it was just very humbling. Um, but it was, it was hard to take a step back because after we had such a huge auction and, and had to get all those auction items out and, and had over a hundred courses where people, we had to coordinate yeah. and it was a big, it was a big task, but so worth it. And, um, now I think more than ever, we are taking a step back to realize because it's really coming to fruition and, and we can see and have, uh, this is the first time I'm announcing this publicly is that we definitely are in contract with land in Costa Rica and are in the design process wow. and um, for structures and buildings and um, building an incredible community of, of healers and people who will actually live on the land and be part of it to help uh, grow all the food and, and nurture the land to uh, have people and guests come and learn just the these ways that we've learned over the last few years so it's it's real it's um you know the the costa rica chapter um look you you've got a you're living in jupiter um life is good you're flying your own plane and these are these are significant changes that you're making and, and obviously predicated upon uh the diagnosis what what was it about costa rica that spoke to you and chelsea that you went this this is this will be home why that's a good question. I, there was a lot of reasons. Uh, over the last five years, I've touched briefly on spirituality. Um, my, try to touch on this as brief as possible. My, my mom was raised Catholic. My dad was atheist. And I didn't um, know where to go. I didn't believe in God. I, I just uh, was very confused by the whole religion thing mm -hmm. and never really got into it learned a lot about a lot of different relig religions um over my journey buddhism uh judaism catholicism everything and, and just try to take it all in and and i realized that pretty much all of them are out for the same thing it's uh it's that spirituality it's that belief in you can call it a higher power you can call it you or me um because if you break it down we're all made up of the same thing and uh, if you want to call it God or, or higher energy, like mm -hmm. it's within us. And um, Costa Rica somehow was, was calling us in, in many different ways from the, the natural practitioner that we learned re regenerative detoxification from Dr. Robert Morris is actually based in Tampa. He says that if you want to have the best fruit in the world, go to Costa Rica because of the volcanic soil and just the, the way the people um, treat each other. They don't have an army. It's, uh, it's very civil and loving. And um, how else? I, I started doing, started researching plant medicine. In the United States, people would categorize it as psychedelics. Um, but it's, it's so much more than that. And it's almost on the level of calling it like alternative med like the alternative medicine right. kind of scheme, I guess. Um, psychedelic is just so much more than that word. It's a, depending on what type of plant that you uh, decide to take a journey with, it's, uh, it's mind blowing. It's a, it's a portal to just oneness really in, in every type that I've done. Um, if it's mushrooms, if it's ayahuasca, iboga, um, San Pedro, which is a cactus that's indigenous to Mexico. It's just, they're, they're all different, but they're all the same. And it's basically just there to educate you that we're all one. And it's, it's so, so powerful and when you realize that that um we the power we have together and, and within ourselves and the the ability that we have to to heal and to just 
the human race is amazing and and we somehow got called costa rica to learn that you uh i I think it was ayahuasca you did some type of special you did some type of cleanse Mm -hmm. um and and you honestly felt that that you thought that the disease was coming out of your body Mm -hmm. i I want you to explain that (laughs) um yeah it's it's hard to explain because when I explain it, it sounds interesting coming out of my mouth. Yeah. And I know to, to listeners, they'll, they'll think that it was just a, a psychedelic kind of trip. Um, but I, it's not for everybody. And it, uh, I hope when people listen to this, they can take it lightly um, and at heart because it's, um, it's close to my heart. I'm passionate about it. And it's something that can teach you so much and have an open mind to it. Because in the beginning, before all this, if, if you told me about this, I would make fun of it as well. That was kind of my uh, way out. You yeah. know, if someone was wearing something weird on the street, like, oh, look at that. Kind of just yeah. funny. And so I did the same thing with these type of plant medicines. But now that my mind is open to it, it's it's amazing. So to get into it. Yeah. This, this ayahuasca journey, um, it was four nights in a row and there were different shamans each night and different mixes. So they, they make the batch out of a, it's a, a, a leaf and a vine, um, mainly indigenous to Peru. And they mix it into this kind of soup paste tea type thing and you take a like a shot of it basically and it smells like molasses and kind of tastes like it too it's very thick and it's different for everybody and and you put an intention into it that's probably the most important thing that i've learned not just for doing ayahuasca but everything that you ingest in your body with if we're going to drink this water right here say something to it or put some energy into it because you can there's been countless studies done that prove that when you put an intention into water, it is the molecular structure does change. And when that goes into your body with your energy in it, it will come into your body and, and be good for you. So no matter what you're ingesting, if you put your intention and your love and your energy in, it, it will um, be beneficial for your for your cells. At least that's what I believe. And mm-hmm. I and, and invite you to do your own research on it. But um, yeah, so the first two nights, they always say to surrender and just like let what happens happens and and be one with your intention and um, don't hold back. And for me, being a man and, you know, growing up in in the United States and like you got to be tough, like the first two nights were really hard for me. I had some visuals, of course, and it was very interesting, but the uh the third night i finally surrendered uh, the first two nights i had a blanket and a pillow and it was like cozied up and the last night you do it when the first star comes out at night so it's um an all night thing and i just had no blanket palms up i was like all right let's go let's see what we can do here and yeah how how in depth do you want me to go here as just deep as you want <laughs> Yeah, there's some interesting things that happen. I I started convulsing in my left leg and then my right arm and then my full body just like, I'm kind of feeling it now, the, a lot of energy going through my body. And had a lot of interesting visuals, this huge, I don't know why, a butterfly and a moth came to me um, and had this huge vine and stuffed this vine in my mouth and took my, took my fingers and pried my mouth open. And I tried, like, I was still conscious at this point. Like I was trying to close my mouth and I couldn't, I was like, what is going on? What's happening? All right, let's just surrender, surrender. And they had this vine and basically stuffed it in my mouth. And I just saw nature coming in like leaves and trees and a monkey head and, and like crazy stuff. So it happened for probably, I don't know, 10 minutes and then they pulled it out and the weirdest things were happening inside my body. 
and they pulled it out and like this, I sat up and this black smoke just came out of my mouth. And at this time, when the, the shaman sees someone struggling or convulsing or, you know, having interesting times, they come over and kind of um, console you, help you, give you some different smells, smoke like sage is really peaceful. And uh, yeah, the, the woman, the shaman next to me said that she saw it as well. And it's just like the most insane feeling ever of having this deep seated something come out of you. Um, yeah, it's like almost like a food poisoning type feeling. And from that moment on, I just, I felt like I was on the right path of, of a healing journey. And, and it just was so mind blowing to me that this all could happen from, from a plant. You know, it's not like, yes, ayahuasca is illegal in the United States, but a lot of other things that are beneficial plants that can grow in out of the ground naturally, uh, are as well. And, um, yeah, it's just a crazy, crazy journey. How much, how much of these experiences, uh, other than Chelsea, have you shared with people that have been close to you in your life? Like, as you're going through this stuff, um, you know, I'm thinking about guys, your peer group on tour, you're, you're, I mean, how many of these guys know these things that you've experienced over the last several years? Not many. Um, I, I've realized that, you know, taking this path, People are going to have their own opinions and judgments, and, and that's okay. And um, everybody is is on their own path. And if this calls out to you, and if if this is interesting to you, then you know, write me on Instagram or uh, go research something. And if not, then go on your own life, and it's okay. Yeah. Um, but there have been some of my really close friends who. I have told and then there's people in my life who uh who are also really close friends that don't believe in this kind of stuff and that i tell anyway and they don't really have anything to say and they kind of just take it in with a their eyebrows raised and a, an interesting look on their face and um i take that as you know maybe maybe 10 years down the road something will click for them and they'll have a, a curiosity towards it or um and do their own research. And if not, then like, it's, it's cool. The, um, you know, one of the things that, that you do is you do a lot of conscious breathing mm -hmm. uh, and maybe, maybe you don't even term it as being conscious breathing. Um, but one of the things that, that, that I've learned because I'm, you know, again, we're all on this, this journey, uh, and, and for, like myself, trying to understand spirituality. And I grew up in a Catholic household uh, and, didn't, and didn't repel against it uh, and, and was an altar boy and loved it. Because uh, the altar to me looked like a stage and I wanted <laughs> a microphone. And I mean, I'm Perfect. serious, seriously. So, but, but when I had to try to, you know, find, you know, my own spirituality, uh, one of the things that I, I, I did was I read several books uh, and one of the things that I learned was that, that spirituality is, deriven, is, is a derivative of the Latin word spiritus, which means to breathe. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I wasn't doing that, Morgan. I wasn't doing that well. I was, and, and I have now taken the time uh, every day to try to, to consciously breathe. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, it's a very helpful thing because it gets my mind still. Mm -hmm. um, and today, particularly in the culture, which you've kind of not entirely left behind, but have really limited, um, there's a lot of noise. And, and it's, I think it's very unhealthy. I think it creates anxiety uh, and tension. And that's not healthy either. Um, so like, as far as your day, what does your day look like at home? Um, yeah, t breathing is super important. I, I, <laughs> that's funny statement coming out of my mouth. Um, yes, of course it's important. <laughs> no, but I mean, we, um, we, we, but conscious breathing is what I'm, I'm really touching on it. And I, it's ironic. My, my neighbor in Costa Rica is a breathwork coach and him and I have f filmed like a 30 day series of, um, going on YouTube and just, uh, kind of going over people's breathworks and, and 
amazing guides and and breathwork facilitators and and doing their breathwork and giving our own opinion kind of we're still trying to figure out how to to release it because it is taking someone else's and we want to give them the credit for it but Mm -hmm. it's been a really cool journey to see how many different types of breathwork there are and how it makes people feel you just said it helps you stay calm and and more relaxed and um there's many types for that and then there's also many types to get you ready for a workout like laird hamilton has an amazing uh breathwork program called xpt um and it's an app you can download on your phone it's really cool i use it uh weekly but um breath work for me is a daily practice um i get up in, in the morning and the first thing i do is take some deep breaths and tell myself i love you um which is something that is new to me uh, the I love you part, I've never mm-hmm. in until this year, really, I never really told myself I love you. And it's, I highly recommend it. It makes you tingle and, and especially looking in the mirror, it's it's kind of hard, especially with me with my shirt off, seeing atrophy. And um, so breath work comes into that with, you know, inhaling joy and gratitude and exhaling all the things that you don't need. Um, so that's one of the first practices, very simple in the morning. Then I go to the gym, um, and i am been in there for about an hour and a half, a lot of stretching, a lot of rolling, um, and then, uh, heavy weight training. And I'm still on the fence of starting to train our, our foundation was, this is huge news for us. We got granted five spots into the New York city marathon this year. Awesome. So I'm deciding if contemplating if I want to start training for that. I've never done anything like that. So it'd be very interesting, but I need to make a decision in the next like I, I, weeks. Well, I mean, again, <laughs> I, 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 I ran New York three times. You did? Yeah. Uh, 2014, 2015 and 2018. How was it? It was, it was mind blowing. Uh, and I did it. My, the impetus for me doing it the first time, uh, my dad passed from a rare form of kidney cancer in 2011. And we, we wanted to, we were going to start a, a fellowship in his name at the University of North Carolina Business School, where he was an admissions director the last six years of his life. So anyway, I, I, I told my family, I said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run the marathon. And I, you know, I ran, but not a big runner, didn't love it. Um, but it was, you know, particularly for you, having grown up in the shadows of New York City, uh, and to, you talk about energy, and to be among those people, uh, I, it and when I did it in 2018, um, which was the last time, and I'm not doing it again. Uh, like every 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 year, the process of doing it was was as almost as rewarding as crossing that line. Like the things that you learn about yourself, like passing through these barriers of I hadn't run 12 before, I hadn't run 15. The one time I ran 20. Um, you learn stuff about yourself, and you talk about your mind, my mental, yeah, the mental part of it, and. God, I mean, for you to do that would be, I think it'd blow your mind. Yeah, that's, running is one of the hardest things. I've always trained with sprinting and like stadiums and that kind of stuff in, in college, but long distance is, is definitely will be a new journey. So maybe after this, we can talk about training. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm telling you, it was, it, it, it changed me. I mean, it changed, you know, the, these these things that you think you can't do and then you do and what that what it what it does to to kind of fortify and 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 make you feel like you're, you're stronger than you thought you were uh before we talk about um you know the the wellness facility that you're gonna that you're gonna build and the fact that you've got the land now i, I want to take you through some words and i want to i want you to expound upon what these words mean to you um, and whether it's now, whether it was when you got the diagnosis, fear, how much fear do you have? Um, fear has never been a big word in my life. Okay. Um, the first thing that pops into my head is actually the, the first iPod I ever got. Our weird story. My, my dad wanted to get me an iPod for Christmas. And this was, I think the first one that ever came out actually maybe a couple series into it but this was the first time you can engrave something on the back of it and i wanted no fear on the back um so i think i still have that and i don't know just being being like a a pilot and paragliding and and skydiving and 
and going in the ocean every day to surf there's there's definitely moments that you could have fear but um i kind of try to overcome that with gratitude because there's so many more things that um can overcome that fear and then also i think will smith once said that uh on the other side of fear is the ultimate pleasure is your ultimate joy because something that you're afraid of and and you can't accomplish it or conquer it is uh makes you better and makes you grow there is uh my my sister shared with me a great line which which amplifies the point you just made uh she sent me a text one time and she said if you're scared it means you're getting ready to do something really brave mm -hmm. um like yeah which which i needed it. i needed it at that moment and you used another word that i think is is one that is not reflected on enough uh and i i now in my life try to do it every day which is gratitude mm -hmm. um and and you know whether it's making a list every night and taking inventory um was it hard to be grateful right away at the end of 2016 the beginning of 2017 was that a learned discipline for you um it was hard to be grateful for everything. Um, there are little things in my life. I, since Nepal, I, I've been practicing gratitude a lot. And every morning waking up and having three things you're grateful for, I found myself being grateful for weird things like my fingernails or like your, your sight. Uh, just like little things that you can be grateful for. It's, ama it's amazing the power that it has in your body and, and your emotions and your energy that day. How about acceptance? Yeah, that's been a huge one for me. Um, it's a weird word because I almost don't want to accept that I have or had muscular dystrophy. I like to use the past tense of it. Um, and I almost, yeah, it's, it's been a, that's a huge word because I, I accept it in a way that I embody that my muscles have it and my body has gone through a disease and I accept it that I am part of this community of muscular dystrophy and I accept it that I have a platform that can help a lot of people, um, but I don't accept it in the way that it's going to affect my life. The, um, the, you know, when you read about certain diseases, um, there are certain diseases that they say they're treatable, but they're not curable. Um, and you're you're essentially pushing back on that mm -hmm. by by saying not only is it treatable but but i can cure myself mm -hmm. is is essentially what your mantra is is it not yeah definitely yeah um i just with all the research i've done you have to find your own opinions and, and mine is that if a gene can be turned on when i'm 20 years old for whatever reasons if it's pesticides on the course if it's the way i ate at buffalo wild wings if it's um, the way that I didn't tell myself I love you. Um, there's so many ways that can change your genetic structure, can change your DNA. Just by doing breath work, you can change your DNA. Just by believing in yourself, by changing the way you, you hold your personality. Um, listen to Joe Dispenza. Um, he's unbelievable. His book that's my most favorite is, is Becoming Supernatural. And it's on audiobook. And once you listen to that, you feel like you can break through brick walls and change anyone's life and your own, especially. You, uh, you're, you're a member of the PGA Tour. You still have starts. Uh, I want to get to that in just a minute. H have you stayed in touch with the PGA Tour? H have you felt a sense of support from them? Yeah, hugely. They've been, the PGA Tour has been incredible. Um, Mr. Monaghan has, has been so supportive, especially with the Courage Award. Which you got in 2020. Mm -hmm. Yep. They, it's obviously a war that you don't want to receive, but uh, is very humbling to, and uh, says a lot about the support that they've given me. And it's it's incredible, and and me and my family and friends are very thankful for it. Um, and yeah, giving me extending my major medical this year, and and talking with Kirsten on the PGA Tour on on a text basis, and asking, all right, if I don't make my my points back, where do I go? Corn Ferry? Do I have can I play Corn Ferry starts before? And she's just, they've been super accommodating. You, um, you have three starts. Um, do you know, do, do you have a, do you have a date circled? I have a, uh, a hefty goal 
of a date circled for Hilton Head. Um, wow. Which is April 14th. Um, but uh, It's five weeks from this week. Yep. Yeah. But um, I'm actually something that most people don't know is that I... Uh, in December, I got in a motorcycle accident and I broke my shoulder and ribs and stitches in my knees and an arm. And um, so I'm recovering from that okay. right now. I'm still getting my flexibility and my, my shoulder and rotator cuff back and getting my speed back. And so that's that's why it's a hefty goal. My okay. my original goal was to come back for Honda because I love that event. Yep. Um, but everything got pushed back two months for, for healing. Okay. Um, you, with the three starts, if essentially you have to make the equivalent of what 125 made, uh, last year, which is just a shade under a million bucks. Uh, I believe I had it written down. I think the 125, it was actually Francesco Molinari was 125 and I think it was like 996. Does that yeah. seem about right? I don't know on, on the money anymore because okay. they go by points well, or yeah. they, and their Kirsten has been telling me that. Um, the amount of points I need to get to be the top 125 from my amount of points that I have from the last year I played on tour. And because that's cumulative from, yep. um, with these next three starts. So what did you have? What was your, how many points do you have currently? That's, sure. I don't know, but I know okay. I need like a hundred ish or okay. so. Um, and then to get the conditional status of like 126 to 150, I need a little less than that. And then if I don't say if I miss all three cuts, um, then I have since I'm vetted on tour for five years, um, you have full status on web for a year. But that's where it gets tricky and interesting because I'm not sure if I would uh, continue. If you want to do that, yeah, I yeah. I've been talking to a bunch of tournament directors um, for lining up hopefully potential sponsor exemptions after these three starts yep. for, for later in the year and. I'm very hopeful and, and would love to um, to play as, as many as I can this year. You you also think that, you know, look, your mind was in a certain place when you played and it and it served you well. You were close uh, a handful of times. I was dying lousy uh, at, the, the, at the API in 2015, uh, at the Arnold Palmer Invitational. Uh, I, I thought you were going to win at Ridgewood, uh, which – that would have been remarkable because uh, that was, you know, that's that's home. Uh, you mentioned Honda. You finished second there, third at the Deer. I mean, you've been you've knocked on the door uh, a number of times, but but coming back now in the state that you're in, and I'm not talking about your physical state. I'm talking about the way you look at the world and and life. Are you better served to play now than you were before? I would say a hundred percent. I've in this journey of off time from golf, I've asked myself uh, some very hard questions. And do I need golf in my life? And the answer is no. Um, do I love golf? The answer is yes. Um, and that's what's driven me back to um, to play and, and try at least again on, on, in these starts. And uh, I have no expectations. I'm going out strictly for for the love of the game. And I'm going to practice my ass off and, and get to the best possible form that I can. Um, and wherever that is, I'll be accepting of it and try on every shot. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm up for the, the grind if it's not on the PGA Tour. Um, I, think, I think I have the ability to be out there and, and winning um and especially with muscles coming back and and testing them in the gym and, and on on the course it's it's really really exciting times i'm, I'm so pumped to kind of test my body and, and see where it goes morgan if if you know if you go back out there and obviously the interest level would be very high uh and i know you probably thought about you and chelsea have thought about this the residual effect that it could have on on the foundation and in the awareness and the support that you might get um there's nothing like having that public platform it's not like like i said you you've already raised over three million dollars uh with with the great support that you've had in just a couple of years but but what this could mean uh for for what you guys are trying to create in costa rica is that one of the driving forces definitely yeah definitely is uh it's it's a great opportunity to um 
to play well and, and hopefully, you know, get interviewed after a good round and, and put in a couple words of um, just in the beginning, you know, making people believe in themselves and um, believe in that there, there are other answers out there that um, you can do your own research. And, and we're, we're so excited to help those people who are interested. The um, I want you to explain what you want the center to be. Um, this is not go to a place, get a massage, you know, watch a ball game, uh, and then have some boneless wings. Uh, it, it, that's not what this is. This is a, this is something uh, that that is, you know, allowing people to dig a lot deeper on themselves. What what is what exactly do you want this vision to become? Well, you know, Gary, it's ever evolving. Um, and from day one, I was just like, oh, I need somewhere that I can have every type of healing modality from acupuncture to dry needling to uh, hyperbaric chambers to massage therapists to an amazing gym. Um, but it's changed so much from that. Now it's more along the lines of having an amazing community of people um, to start and have this space that you can come to learn uh, ways to grow your own food, how to coexist with nature, how to become a human being in the ways that I've researched, that we've researched, and that's very natural and, and one with yourselves, one with others, nature. Um, and so what we Chelsea and I are envisioning now is to have this community of our close friends and, and healers and uh, permaculturists and, and biodynamic growers uh, from fruit trees to herb gardens. Um, and once we have this running, the people that are living on the property will be an integral part of it. It'll be like a, an ego, ecosystem on its own. And when we open the doors to maybe 10 to 15 people at a time um, for uh, an extended period of time to come in and learn the ways that we have found can heal people naturally in the way that we give them the ability to heal themselves. Um, we're, not, we're not trying to tell you how to heal. We're not saying that we can heal you. We're saying that you can heal yourself. And if you come to our space, um, you will be able to learn uh, ways that can educate you on, on how to take care of yourself naturally. Do you, do you miss um, just the, the time that you used to spend? And it was ample time with guys like Ricky Fowler and Cameron Tringali and Justin Thomas and, and Daniel Berger and these guys that, you know, you were all chasing the dream together um, and you spent a lot of time away from, from the golf course together. Do you miss those guys? Yeah, yeah. They're, they've been a big part of my life. And um, every time I see them or, you know, Cameron Tringali's wearing Grayson now. So yeah. I see him a lot in, in photos and it's, it's awesome to see. He, he just had a child as well. And um, no, it's, it's uh, an amazing memory. And the, the phrase you said, tra chasing the dream, kind of hit home for me. Um, and the dream to me was to be on the PGA tour, mm -hmm. to win on the PGA tour, to be number one and, and to be playing golf nonstop all the time. But, um, it's really nice to see that other PGA tour players are not only just playing golf, they're, they're starting their own foundations. They're starting their own charities to give back. And I think that, um, golf has an amazing platform to reach incredible people who can, be movers and shakers in, in many different industries and charitable foundations and philanthropic um, movements. And um, I think there's a bigger picture than just golf. And, and the dream now is to, to help as many people as possible. When you have your event every year, and, and I don't think it's a hard ask when you ask these guys to, to give of their time and, 
it's again from the jump it was remarkable the the response that you get and that's not just it's not just the guys who play on the PGA tour it's people who've come into your life people athletes from other walks of life and musicians and uh, you can go on down the list you've got a you've got a, a, a hell of a network of friends um, you talk about humility and gratitude um, when you ask them do you even have to say do you even have to go into you know like how much it would I mean do, do you just say hey look here's the date and they all just jump? Um, I would love if that were the case. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's it's completely understandable. Everybody has such tough schedules and, and a lot of guys on all the guys on the PJ Tour are playing pro ams constantly. Yeah. And the PJ Tour is a tough schedule and it's tough on families and you're traveling forty weeks out of the year and and um, a lot of people say no and it's completely understandable because there's pro ams that I've turned down when I was playing on tour because of I needed my mental health or my, I needed recovery for my physical body and um so yeah it's it's harder than uh you would think but um then there's the only thing I would love is if just everybody responded just like hey you know what no I, I'm not available this week instead of you know not answering but right. it's, everyone is on their own journey and and uh has their own things that they're dealing with. So it's the ones that do show up are, are meant to be there and are we're so grateful for because it's a huge help for us. Before before I get to the, 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 the frivolous part of this, which is just asking you five silly questions. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the book, uh, The Obstacle is the Way. I'm not actually. Wait, okay. Who's it written by? Uh, Ryan Holiday. Okay. Okay, I've got a copy with me to give to you because you embody it and I and th there's here's just essentially what what the the tone of the book is um, and it says the impediment to action advances action um, which stands in the way becomes the way and to make certain that that what impedes us can empower us mm -hmm. and that that you have you have found something um, in your life that 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 came crystal clear what it was toward the latter part of 2016 and here we are at the beginning and the outset of of 2022 uh and that obstacle has empowered you mm -hmm. it's empowered you uh to find out so much more about yourself and and together with chelsea more about each other um and in turn you're trying to affect and change lives um so in some ways to, i mean again blessings are a strange thing to try to you know understand and define mm -hmm. But in some ways, you've been blessed to have this thing affect you in a way that now you are you are impacting and changing the trajectory of other people's lives. Oh yeah, I'm I'm so grateful for it. I yeah, if if I didn't have this, I would probably still be on tour and and caught up in material things and um, complaining about silly like not having the proper food and player dining or <laughs> things like that just <laughs> don't really matter. And, uh, it's, uh, yeah, obstacles are, are what make us better, what make us stronger. Um, no one's ever gotten anywhere from, from an area of comfort. Um, one of the people that popped into my mind to get ready for the, the marathon possibly is David Goggins. Have you heard of him or yeah. seen his, his yeah. videos on Instagram? Just stay hard. And, it's um he hates running and he is arguably one of the best out there because he knows that the way to get better is through and um yeah it's it's just an attribute to having those obstacles having those impediments to well there, there's a there's a documentary film uh among several things i would recommend if you're going to do this that will that will not only motivate you but you know, it, again, it gets it gets to the whole point of, you know, what am I capable of? And the, the, it's called running the Sahara. Okay. Uh, and it was Matt Damon was one of the one of the producers of it. And a buddy of mine, Mark Joubert, was one of the other producers uh, and three guys who did not know each other came together and they ran the equivalent of two marathons a day for one hundred and twenty one straight days. What? Yeah. Through every ecosystem. Um yeah that's hard to comprehend it, it, it's and it, the film is beautiful it's a beautifully shot film uh about these guys doing this wow yeah 
All right, I'm watching that. Yeah, no, you're. I'm telling you, you will you will absolutely love it. All right, let let's finish with with five questions, uh, and you may answer this by what you had last night. What is, but this, but you, what you had the the truffle drizzled uh, Brussels sprout you had last night is not part of your diet. What is the tastiest thing in your diet? Um, right now it's this ice cream I've been making. Um, it's just freezing bananas and then taking them out of the freezer and then adding blended strawberries and dates and that's it. And it's unbelievable. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not in player dining. All right. Who is the most talented guy you've ever played with? Um, that's a great question. Probably Justin Thomas, I'd say. Um, I knew it when he first moved to Jupiter and we were at the Bears Club playing, having wedge contests. And it was just, uh, it was incredible. He, his mindset was different. He was trying to hold anything inside of a nine iron, basically. Um, and it helped me get my wedges so much better. And, and when, uh, yeah, just his, his talent in, in wedges is pretty okay. immaculate. All right. Um, Let's see here. What is what if any creature comforts or guilty pleasures do you miss? Is there anything you really miss? Um, that's a good question. Um, yeah, there's there's things that I miss. Um, like what? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why this is coming <laughs> into my mind, but I think it like chilies or like one of these. Ter Jellies. Terrible oh. restaurants. There is that lava cake. You know that chocolate lava cake <laughs> that like explodes. Wow. Uh, one of those. I'm not yeah. sure, but um, yeah, chocolate has been something that I, I love. Um, now it's evolved into like raw cacao, uh, which is a fruit, and uh, there's so many ways to prepare it. But that it's always been a part of my life, and it's actually very good for you in certain ways. Okay. All right, for for people who don't know, you you bought a plane. I think you bought it from an old, from a hockey player. Mm -hmm. You don't still have the plane, do you? That was my first plane. I, since then, I have another one. Oh, you there. do. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, your your favorite airport or favorite place to fly into? Mm, Montauk, New York. Oh yeah. Very small airport out on the ocean. Um, deer on the runway. It's just a wow. an exhilarating experience. And my buddy has a sailboat like 200 yards from there. So I go and stay there in the summer and it's, it's so amazing. That's great. <laughs> All right, last thing, what's your dream? I have a lot of dreams. Um, dream is to just empower people to know that they're more powerful than they have been educated to believe. Um, and not even educated to believe that they don't even, can't even fathom that they're self-healing, that they can do anything that they accomplish, that, that they want to accomplish. And to give a space that is an example for others to come after me, um, to leave this incredible space in Costa Rica for for people to learn from and grow from and um, better themselves in the most simple ways. Um, when I asked you if you wanted to do this, you said, yeah, and you said, I'm coming. And I said, you don't realize I'm not, not on the other side of Costa Rica. I'm in Charlotte. And you said, no, I'm coming. Um, I, I can't tell you, you know, gratitude, um, humbled, um, and most importantly, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of what you're doing. It's, um, it's, it's beyond impressive. It's inspirational. Um, and I appreciate you making the time to come up here and be here. Um, and, and whatever little part that any of us that are part of my world now uh, can do for you, you know that I'm always here for you. Um, so thanks for being here, my friend. No, thank you so much. It, it, you already are doing it, just uh, um, inviting me onto this. And it means the world. Uh, I thank you for for always supporting me and, and being there from the day we met and emceeing our, our event at, at Arcola. And 
um, yeah, you've been an integral part of our foundation and um, friendship. So thank you so much, Gary. Well, I'm looking forward to being with you in a couple of weeks as well. Yeah. Uh, well. At, a, at, at, at a place that I know you love, which is Ohoopi. So that is Morgan Hoffman. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time uh, to watch, to listen. And again, the Morgan Hoffman Foundation, go to morganhoffman.org. Uh, you can find out much more about all of the endeavors uh, not to mention you can make a donation and I'll say it once again, a lot of a little is a lot. So please go there and give if you can. For all of us here at Five Clubs, we'll see you next time on the Five Clubs Conversation.